Good morning. It is the second Sunday of Easter, and our gospel text for today comes from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came that day. So the other disciples told them, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark, of the, on, on, in the mark on his side, I will not believe. So a week later, the disciples were once again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it on my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you in peace from God the Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the great life giver. So this is a familiar story about Thomas. So let's start by really setting the scene. It's Sunday, it's Easter Sunday. It's earlier that morning, Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb, saw it was empty, she wept possibly because she thought that Jesus' body had been stolen, and then she encountered Jesus. She goes back, tells the disciples, and how do they receive the news? With joy and dancing? (sighs) Not so much. Pretty much how you or I would receive it. Amazement, cynicism, unbelief. Mary, what have you been smoking? What have you been drinking? They're in a house. It's evening, the doors are locked, they're hiding because the Jewish leaders had effectively turned over to Rome, the occupying army, one of their own kind. And who knows where they'll stop? Will they stop at just the leader? Or maybe they should start picking up some of his key followers and do those as well. It's a new week. Anything could happen. We all have this visceral feeling now for being locked in our house out of some sense of fear this year, don't we? We don't know where this is going to end. The disciples are fearful. We are fearful. Good news from Mary did not erase the fear. Good news, incredible news, can ignite hope, but it doesn't completely eliminate fear. Imagine someone coming out and saying, an antidote has been found. We'd have joy, but we'd still be wary, still social distancing, still washing our hands. 
So if the disciples still have fear, and if we still have fear, what does the resurrection really mean? Does it have meaning for us? Well, what does it mean? The first thing it means is that God shows up. Jesus showed up. In the midst of their fear, their confusion, their disbelief, Jesus shows up and says the typical greeting of the Jewish people, Shalom Aleichem, just like our brothers in the Middle East also say, Asalam Aleichem, peace be unto you. And shalom just doesn't mean be calm. It means be deeply centered. All is right with the world. It's the peace that passes all understanding. There's no anxiety. It's all good peace. God shows up in the midst of our fears, our confusion, and our disbelief. I can't believe this is happening. God shows up and says, peace, be chill. Yeah, it's a little crazy out there, but God says, I've endured worse. We can trust that. God's here. Let's be cool. The disciples knew it was Jesus. They recognized the scars, the wounds, the damage done, and then they rejoiced. He's not dead. He's back. It'll be all right with the world again. They probably went through a range of emotions before they rejoiced, though. They were astonished. Really? They rubbed their eyes. And that probably quickly turned to shame. After all, they had all deserted him when he was receiving those wounds. They probably thought that Jesus would be entirely justified in yelling at them, calling them cowards and worthless excuses for disciples. Maybe they were even a little afraid of what he would say. And then Jesus opens his mouth and says, Peace be upon you. You could hear the collective exhalation of everyone there, the relief. The body of Christ shows up for us, too. In the people who risk their lives daily to provide medical care, who sew masks on the sewing machines that they haven't used for years, who call each other to just see if they're doing okay, who run errands for those who are compromised or bring them food. The body of Christ is still here. The world may still be all right. Are we astonished? <laughs> yeah. Are we maybe a little ashamed that we haven't done more? Do we fear what others will think? Peace be upon you. <sighs> Exhale. You are enough. God is with you. God will inspire you to do what you can do. And then Jesus says it again, peace be upon you. God sent me, so now I send you. Go out, forgive. Whew. Who has sinned against you? Who has given you scars or wounds or done damage to you? We've all got them. Who can you just not stand who makes you cringe or makes you angry? God is saying, peace be unto you. Now go out and forgive them. Restore that relationship. I know you've been beaten and betrayed, so have I, God says. You can still forgive. We always have that choice. Viktor Frankl, 
The Viennese psychologist who endured the Nazi death camps said, the one thing that no one can ever take away from us is the ability to choose how we respond. This is the lesson of Job. Everything was taken away. His body was covered with boils and disease, but he still praised God. The same way that Frankel and many of his fellow prisoners did. This pandemic and quarantine is tough on many people. It probably boils up in your household as tempers flare and patience wears thin. You might be getting new scars, wounds, or damage. God is saying, peace be unto you. Go and forgive. And God has given us this time to do just that, to learn how to forgive more readily, more easily, more often. Jesus was sent into the world by God to reveal who God is and how God was, to teach about God and to gather disciples to continue his ministry. Now Jesus is sending the disciples, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Go reveal God to the world by what you do and what you say. Teach by example and gather folks to keep this going. Start by forgiving. And forgiving again. And again. How many times do I have to forgive? 70 times 7. Now, Thomas. That poor guy has gotten a real bad rap, doubting Thomas. Thomas wasn't there the first time. Was he hiding somewhere else? Was he alone, afraid of even being in a small group? Boy, do these texts have echoes to today that make us shiver, right? Thomas is merely asking for the same experience the others had. They had a measure of peace and a renewed confidence that he didn't, and he wanted it. So this isn't a story of Thomas's failure to believe as much as it's the story of how Jesus, how God is willing to meet us exactly where we are, Jesus shows up again. Thomas is not chastised for not believing. He's invited. Look and see. I'm here. God does not chastise us for not believing. God shows up. God is willing to meet us where we are, even in quarantine. Again and again, God invites us to look and see. God is here. Do we doubt? Oh yeah, we all doubt. I doubt, you doubt. I haven't met anyone who doesn't doubt. I've met a few that don't admit that they don't doubt, but they all do. We all have fears and anxieties, fear of failure, fear of public ridicule, fear of being wrong, fear of losing the respect of people we admire, fear of losing our stuff. What keeps us from fulfilling the mission that God has sent us to do? What keeps us from forgiving? In my case, it's usually my ego. The fear that I am just as broken and damaged as the next person, which I am. But I don't want to admit it. Because I was hurt. Because I didn't get something I thought I deserved. But it's also doubt. Doubt that I can do it. Fear of ridicule. Fear that my belief is not strong enough. God does not chastise us for not believing. God shows up. God is willing to meet us where we are again and again. God invites us to look and see because God is here. God invites us to go out with the peace that doesn't make any sense and give and forgive, to not worry, to have confidence that God will provide all we need from confidence to resources 
to have faith. It doesn't matter if we come to that faith by seeing before we believe or by believing before we see. I had to go through my own times of uncertainty, fear, damage, wounds, scarring, to see before I believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. You know, it's impossible to establish the factness, the reality of the resurrection to everybody's satisfaction. There are no rules of evidence that everyone will agree to. Faith is not based on facts. It is fundamentally rooted in doubt. Faith and doubt go together. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. When we think that we know for sure what God wants, walking by faith means walking in the company of doubt and keeping going forward anyway. When we are anxious or feel threatened, our natural instinct is to hunker down and lock the doors. We become focused on our own security rather than on the risky mission that we've been called to. And when we do that, Jesus comes to us because Jesus cannot be stopped by locked doors. Jesus comes to us in the midst of our fear, of our pain, of our anxiety, in the midst of our doubt. Jesus comes and speaks peace, bringing us the Holy Spirit to bring inspiration as to how we can be sent out into the world given our current restrictions. So go out, pick up the phone and call, run an errand, sew some masks, whatever. The Spirit will inspire you, peace be with you. God is here. God will keep showing up. Jesus came back a week later for Thomas. God comes back week after week in the bread and the wine, in the baptismal waters, and mostly God comes back in God's word. Thomas confesses, my Lord and my God Not the Lord and the God, but my, because the relationship is personal. God's word is personal. In the beginning, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God still dwells among us. God still shows up in our locked rooms, in the cages of our fears, in the quarantines of the pandemic, God shows up. God does not want us to miss out on the life and the peace that only God can bring. So go out and share God. Amen.